Hey friends, welcome back to Thrive Online Healing Podcast. This is episode 104, and we're going to talk about chronic infections, would you say? Like, infections. Yes. Yeah. Um, again, this will be the Carmen show, but I think this, I heard this in a different podcast and it was really interesting. Um, and so I thought I wanted Carmen's take on it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, this topic can always be like a little bit, I don't know, tricky, I guess, if you will. Um, because it's talking about the immune system, but we're also talking about um, sort of opportunistic uh, bugs. And those bugs can be bacteria, viruses, um, fungus, yeast, and even parasites. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sneeze. Um, And so uh, it's interesting to see how they mm, uh, maneuver around our immune system. So First thing I'm going to start out with. So we know that they're like acute infections, right? Like you get an upper respiratory infection, you get strep, you get a cold, flu, whatever. Um, That usually lasts two weeks. Um, Anywhere, if it's a new, something new that you've never had before, it could do 10 to 14 days, but usually seven to 10 days before your immune system um, completely clears that infection. It's considered an acute infection. And then there are chronic infections that are, um, I'm going to relabel this. So they're chronic infections that last longer than that, um, that can last up to four to six weeks. Um, And then there are latent infections. And so a chronic infection is usually something that your immune system is still actively pursuing. Okay. Um, uh, it's so your immune system is still actively trying to get rid of that infection, um, wherever it is in our body. If it's a pneumonia, if it's like a abscess or sepsis, if it's, um, uh, anywhere else. And then if you're usually that chronic infection, it can, um, decrease that infection can kind of decrease in infective load um, or some bugs can become latent where they have a tendency to hide within our immune system okay so um we call this chronic infections and it is but it's often chronic to like that latent is where we're going to talk about a little bit more now to help understand you know like kind of not just how our immune system works but how we respond to things i think it's important to understand that we have different antibodies like our immune system is usually made up of like this innate immune system and then this adaptive immune system um adaptive can also be called acquired And an innate immune system is um, our cells that um, are always turned on. They're always like out there trying to kill things. So things like um, our natural killer cells, our macrophages, they're always on the prowl looking for things that um, shouldn't be there, that are foreign to our body. And an adaptive and acquired immune system is once our immune system has learned that something is foreign, um, it kind of uh, brings in reserve. So it sends the information to our immune system, and then it starts building that library and kind of training those soldiers to go out and attack this particular thing, right? This um, infective bug. And so, and like I said, those bugs can be viruses, bacteria, fungus, parasites, yeast. So that's why we're keeping it generic because it's not just bacteria and viruses. Um, And the, um, that acquired or adaptive immune system um, creates that library in our body of, um, in case you're exposed again, in case you're, um, if you start to see those infection cells again, and that innate immune system is who's uh, patrolling all the time, uh, sees those things, then um, it can go to the library and say, hey, we've already seen this before. Um, So then it can just trigger these T cells to go out and um, attack it. So then usually that infection doesn't take a whole seven to 10 days. It may only take two or three, right? So that's the um, part of the difference. Another piece of this is the immune uh, antibody response. 
So we actually have five different antibodies. So um, uh, these are like IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, and IgE, okay? Most folks may have heard of IgE because that is what creates the anaphylaxis reactions that people have to shrimp and like peanuts and stuff like that. Yeah. And then, um, so that is usually like uh, in the allergy field. So if people have a lot of allergies, oftentimes their IgEs are often really stirred up. Um, but usually like the first immune cells that our body starts creating is IgMs. Um, they're the largest, but that's what we start to create to um, address whatever foreign uh, uh, microbes that our body has identified, okay? Mm -hmm. Then it's IgGs and those are a little bit, um, those are smaller and they're much more abundant. Um, so when we get labs, sometimes we're looking for IgGs or IgMs to a particular virus, say, yeah. Okay. You look like you have a question. I do, I have lots. Okay, first, um, acute means short, right? Like, yes. And then late Usually less than two weeks. Okay. And Leighton, I looked up the definition of it. It said existing, but not yet developed or manifested, hidden or concealed. Yes. But that's why you're saying latent chronic illness. It's because the way the, the species, whether it's a virus, bacteria, parasite, it's kind of playing hide and go seek within our body. Like it goes and hides and then it reemerges, hides and reemerges, right? Yes. I'm going to talk more about that. Okay. Yes. I'm just, not there yet, but yes. I wanted to make sure we have all the, like, because sometimes I hear podcasts and they throw these words and I'm like, oh, okay. And I don't really fully understand the words. And then I don't fully understand the concept. Got it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. Very good. Sort Any other questions? Um, not yet. That IG stuff. I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about, but. Okay. <laughs> so the only reason why I wanted to bring up the IgGs, mm -hmm. um, IgMs, the, the different types of antibodies are produced is because uh, those play a role if you're trying to, like, you, you want to see an infectious doctor or you say, hey, I want to know if my mono, like I had mono as a kid in college, and I want to know if my mono is flaring right now. And they look at uh, labs or titers for mono, for EBV, but sometimes docs will only run like the IgG and they don't run IgM or IgA, or they'll just do the capsid and they won't do the envelope. Um, so I just want to throw that out there as examples of, hey, if somebody has, you know, runs labs for you to say, hey, you know, uh, is my viral load um, on the charts and they don't run the full panel, you won't get the whole picture. So what would a person need to ask to make sure? Like, what's the lay person supposed to say to their doctor? Like, will you run an envelope lab or what's the wording? So you want to ask for um, uh, a latent EBV panel, okay, okay. Um, to determine the viral load. Now, most docs can look that up. But we're looking, we want to see the envelope, we want to see the capsid antibodies, um, and the nuclear antibody. So there's actually three different types of antibodies we're looking for. And then we want the IgGs and the IgMs for but each if, one of those. But if I ask for the latent EB latent viral panel, viral. Yeah. that just includes all of that, right? That includes all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do that for mono, for that EBV Epstein-Barr. Technically, you can do that for um, varicella or for shingles um, and like the pox viruses. The labs are out there. A lot of conventional docs may not know about them, but you can order them through um, just like Quest or DLO or any of those um, lab core. And then the same thing for Lyme or a lot of the tick fevers. Um, you want the whole, always ask for a panel. Don't just say, Hey, I want to be tested for mono, or I want to be tested for Lyme. Ask for the panel because then that will indicate it's more than one thing that we're looking at at a time. Okay. And those are all separate panels. Yes. They're all separate. 
and those only tests for that specific thing. So then if people are like, well, what if I have a bacterial, a, a latent bacterial, a latent parasitic, then they have to specifically ask for a latent bacterial panel, a latent parasympa, uh, parasitic panel. Yes, if you suspect something like that, you're gonna have to work with a practitioner to kind of narrow it down okay. a little bit. Um, yeah, um, because you won't be able to walk in and say, hey, I want a latent bacterial panel. They won't know what you're talking about. So okay. you have to, yeah, you'll have to work with a practitioner to be a little bit more specific and figure out what you wanna identify. Then you can, yeah, um, go from there. Okay, all right. Are you gonna talk about the different, um, like the different, I don't know what you call them, Carmen. Um, okay. They're in the white blood cells. You know how they're like neutrophils, um, monocytes, because each one of those kind of gives you a clue to when one of them is higher, it gives us a clue to like, this is bacterial or this is viral, or this is para or parasitic, right? Is that how you kind of start chasing the rabbit trail? Is like you look at the white blood cell count breakdown. This is high, this might be bacterial. Let's do a, ba a bacterial panel. Yes. So, um, there, so usually when people have like what we call a CBC, so I'll come back to this. Um, when we have, uh, when you have a CBC run, which stands for complete blood count, um, usually they're looking at the first two lines, the white blood cells and the red blood cells. Okay. Um, and the white blood cells is the overall like umbrella of your immune system. Okay. And oh, um, under that umbrella, you have the specific breakdowns. Now at that white blood cells, I always want, um, there's usually a range between like each lab's a little bit different, but it's usually in the ballpark of like four, um, four to 10 and it's four with the exponentials, like 40,000 to a hundred thousand. Um, so you'll see like a exponential mark to it. Um, and I want your white blood cell count to be like in the middle, but usually around like six or seven is considered optimal. So when that white blood cell count is like four or less than four, um, that tells me that your reserves, like those immune cells that are like naturally kind of patrolling all the time are um, not up to par and need some support. OK, so that means that you're at an increased risk of um, infections. You may get sick all the time because those white blood cells are on the low end. OK, okay. Um, then your red blood cells, that's usually looks at your anemia. Um, then the hemoglobin hematocrit are all different indicators of, uh, of anemia as well. And then. Uh, if you go further down in your CBC, you'll see um, some more that talk about like your MCV, MCHC. Those tell us like the size of your red blood cells. And then um, we will see the lymphocytes and you have a breakdown. So it'll say, and usually you'll see the absolutes and the percentages. Yep. And so they're a little bit uh, different. Usually I have folks... Um, pay attention to uh, one, not necessarily the other because they're direct. One is usually when they look at it and the other one um, is just sort of the, those percentages, just like the averages, okay? Um, and sometimes they can kind of be off the charts and sometimes, um, but if they're off the charts, they'll, they'll both be the percentages and the absolutes, okay? okay? All right, so, um, when we're looking at those specific breakdowns. So um, the, let's see, lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, the eosinophils. We'll start with the eosinophils. Um, the eosinophils are usually, I see this high, especially in a lot of Oklahomans, um, because the eosinophils uh, usually represent allergies. It's an allergic reaction, those IgE, um, reactions or the IgG reactions. Um, if you have a lot of um, allergies, um, if you have parasites can also be elevated with eosinophils. And um, 
I, this is another thing I just came across last week is um, uh, if you are on a lot of medication, that can also raise your eosinophils. Um, because I, we were going down the rabbit trail and I thought this person, um, had a parasite because they had a lot of GI issues. We started going through and I asked him what medications he was on. Um, and he was on two of them that have been known to raise your eosinophils because his eosinophils, uh, were in like the 600 and usually we want to see zero to 500. And I was like, oh, you're off the charts. Why is that? Um, so a uh, long-term medication use can also create eosinophilia. So we call that when those are elevated, but, um, if you have allergies, usually less than 5%, um, or in absolute, I think that's 50. Um, I'm trying to pull up a CBC so I can read it next to, next to us here. Um, and, um, but if it's parasitic, usually you'll be on the upper end. If it's parasites um, in the digestive tract, it'll be on the upper end. So closer to that 500, like 300 and higher. Now, a lot of conventional docs won't say anything about eosinophils because it's most likely associated with allergies. And they know that a lot of people have allergies. So if your eosinophils are high um, or if they get flagged, a lot of times they don't say anything because they're like, oh, we expect you to have eosinophils. That's not a big deal. Or allergies, that's not a big deal. Okay. I think mine is like 79. That's like, oh, she has allergies. But if it was like 299 is like, she has allergies and probably a parasite is what I'm hearing you say when it gets to that high a level. Yeah, when it's higher, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. following you. So, um, yes. Um, so I, I always put it in context, right? Because like I said, um, this last one, I, yeah, was all ready to start diving into digestive health and parasites. And um, it was... It was because of prescriptions. <laughs> so you got to put it in context, right? Like that um, by itself gives us information, but it's not a ton of information. Right. Okay. Yep. And then um, now if eosinophils are high and monocytes are high, um, that's when that puts it in context. That gives me another marker that, okay, maybe it is parasites. Um, because sometimes parasites can be a low functioning infection right and we may not always know it parasites don't always cause like a lot of symptoms really quickly it's usually something that gradually like builds up over time because those parasites are growing in your body over time and the uh higher the population the more you know symptoms we see so um so if those two together are high that's when we start to kind of go down that rabbit trail now, um, monocytes in general is part of sort of the macrophages and they're kind of that cleanup crew, okay? Mm -hmm. So monocytes over, um, we expect those to be a little bit more elevated um, after an infection, okay? So that's not usually an acute. So usually a chronic infection is when we start to see monocytes um, a little bit higher, a little bit more elevated. Now, we don't see monocytes um, often in latent infections um, because those latent infections are often hiding. So there's nothing really there for the macrophages to go in and kind of clean up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I, somebody told me, or Dan Garner, this is where I heard this, got this episode from with Dan Garner. Um, but he calls them, they're like the eater cells. They just go eat cells. Like, yeah. Those are the macrophages. Um, so I was taught that to think of them a lot like um, uh, garbage disposals. <laughs> I like Pac-Man, how I invented yep. them. They're the Pac-Man, they're the um, um, like the garbage truck going around, right? And picking up trash. They're always looking for the debris and breaking down the debris. Yes, yeah. So that's why they're in the recovery phase of infections. Cool. Okay, now when you have an acute or an active infection, um, usually you'll see those white blood cells will be high. If it is a severe infection, you'll see those white blood cells 11 um, over 10, but 11 or higher. And then your lymphocytes should also be high, okay? Those lymphocytes are part of that IgM, IgG, that initial reaction, 
Okay. okay. So usually you see those um, high in acute um, acute episodes. Um, they can, so sometimes chronic, when we said that over four weeks, the white blood cells will begin to come down your WBCs, but the lymphocytes will continue to remain elevated. Yeah, because they are the ones that are, um, who have been programmed, those reserves, right? Those so reserve soldiers that are going out and now addressing the infections. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, um, this can also be high with inflammation. Mm -hmm. So lymphocytes, because it's that IgG, um, can be very high with inflammation. So for some folks, if their white blood cells are normal, but your lymphocytes are elevated or on the high end of normal, um, that's where we look at uh, inflammation. So we call this the poor man's um, measure for inflammation instead of doing like uh, an ESR, uh, a SED rate or like a CRP um, because this one is already all in the same lab. So this one will tell us if you're having a lot of like um, inflammation, it could be because of like leaky gut or because like arthritis um, or even autoimmune conditions, uh, these lymphocytes can be a little bit more elevated. And that's where we're looking at those long-term IgG cells that are floating around in your body. And, I, and Dan said they're also related to viral infections, indicative of a viral infection as well. Yes. Yeah. So usually they're, yeah, your viral infections um, are lymphocytes. Yes. Yeah. But lymphocytes indicate inflammation and or viral infections. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, let's see. So um, another piece to inflammations can be uh, basophils. Okay. Okay. Oftentimes we don't see a lot um, about basophils. So your basophils may come up high and oftentimes so nobody says anything about it. Um, but if you have the basophils are high uh, with the lymphocytes that to those together, again, we're trying to put pieces together, right? Those together can be inflammation. Um, now, sometimes that's acute, but that can also be chronic inflammation. Okay. And then the neutrophils, um, can be high with bacterial infections, mm -hmm. um, especially at the beginning. Uh, so those are kind of obvious, right? You'll, high, you'll see high white blood cells, you'll see high neutrophils. That tells us, oh, okay, they have something like, like strep or um, uh, you, if somebody is really, really sick with like um, uh, sepsis or something, you'll see the neutrophils kind of off the charts as well. Now, over time, we're talking about the chronic viral and latent infections. Sometimes you can see those neutrophils really low. So you can see like a, the, um, a neutropenia, which so when those neutrophils are low and the lymphocytes are a little bit on the higher end of normal, they may not be, like I said, this is within the range, right? But the higher end of normal, those two pieces together can tell us that you have a chronic um, infection right? Or a latent infection that has kind of reared its head again and is now causing flares or yeah, um, symptoms for you to feel poorly. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Can I tell okay. A What's that? Can I tell a cool story? Sure. So my father-in-law got really sick recently. Um, and they, like, we couldn't, we were guessing and we couldn't figure out why. And then he went to the doctor and all of his labs came back in the normal range, right? And so I asked, because I had heard this podcast episode, <laughs> I was like, well, what's the breakdown of his like neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, right? And then she gave us her numbers and based on my very uneducated <laughs> knowledge, I was like, oh, his neutrophils are high. I was like, I wonder if this is a bacterial infection. So then they ran more labs, right? And it came back. Sure enough, he had a bacterial infection. Yay, Kim. Yay. He had, um, and it was, it was not, it's not good, but he had strep infection in his heart. Ah, uh, yes. But yeah. I was like, this is so cool. Like just that little bit of knowledge, like at least help me like, I think this is a bacterial infection based on like what I could kind of put two and two together. Right, yeah. Cool. 
<laughs> That's awesome. That's perfect, right? Like you're using the information. Um, because sometimes when people don't feel well and they're getting really sick and um, they will run labs and they'll be like, either we don't know what's going on or we think that you have an infection, but we don't know where it is. Yeah. Um, or they don't know what it is. So the, um, the uh, standard of care is that they run the labs and if things don't get flagged, right? So you said they're within normal range. If they don't get flagged um, and they think that they suspect that somebody is still sick, they will do blood cultures, okay? Um, which take three days to grow. So that person is oftentimes declining in that three days. They may do like a broad spectrum antibiotic if they can, um, but that's sort of the standard of care. So they don't actually look at this breakdown and that range um, for our CBC is very wide. We've talked about, you know, like we're very broad ranges. And so to be honest, I don't see very many red flags. Like sometimes they'll come up and it'll be, it may say high or low, but I don't know why there's sort of this disconnect, but um, they often don't explain their CBC to them. They'll just say, oh, it looks fine. All they're looking for is anemia or if you have that white blood cell, whether you're gonna be okay for surgery or not. Um, they don't look at the breakdown. You'll think, well, why are they doing all this extra work? <laughs> at putting the information on the paper if you're not going to look at it. Right. And if this information can tell a lay person like myself, like just that little bit of information, like, oh, this is probably bacterial. Like, yeah. why wouldn't someone that's educated, like use this as huge, like clues on a map? Yeah. I, um, to be honest, they're always not always taught that. Yeah. So that's why when I look at labs, I'm always looking, I was like, you've already had the labs and this was supposed to be a data set. Let's, you know, maximize the amount that we can gather from this before like running all these other tests or, you know, um, people suffering for a little bit longer just to, yeah, get uh, another confirmation. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for letting me share my nerd story. So. No, I'm excited you're able to use that and see that in practice. You see it in action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to look at their labs, get a copy of them. If you're going in for, you know, your annual um, visit, or even I had one person bring me a um, biometric screening that, you know, if you do like a life, life screen, life line screening or something that your work does, Take advantage of that, get that information and then look at it. Don't just trust that somebody says, oh yeah, things are fine. You know, everything's within normal limits. Hmm. What does that mean for you? So yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit more um, about some of how these infections go from chronic to latent. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, when we're thinking about these different bugs, bugs, so viruses are excellent at this. Um, things like, again, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, like for mono, or CMV, cytomegalovirus, can also produce mono. Um, varicella for chicken pox, um, HSV one and two, like for herpes, um, the shingles, uh, the shingles virus, which is the same family as varicella. Um, but even things like, uh, Lyme, um, Babesia, uh, Ehrlichiosis, um, Bartonella, um, Malaria even, um, these may be things that you guys have heard of, but they may not. Um, but so they're, they're organisms, right? Just like any other, just like us, we're an organism. We're a multicellular complex organism, but we're still organisms. Um, so each one of these have uh, a what we call adapt, a, um, adaptations uh, to our environment, which our environment is our body. Okay. So they can be a little bit camouflaged, just like we see in the wild chameleons and octopus, 
octopi, right? That they can camouflage uh, with their surroundings. Some of these viruses um, and even parasites can do that in our body, um, is that they can kind of camouflage themselves. So what that means is they change their cellular structure. So they look like our cells. So then our body, those monocytes, those macrophages, those um, natural killer cells that are constantly patrolling, looking for something that's foreign, they may see something um, that they're like, you know, not entirely sure that it's foreign, but enough of that organism looks like our cells that it'll won't it won't target it uh for destruction it'll say oh this looks like our cells it doesn't look foreign that's because these um organisms can change their cellular structure and camouflage to our body yeah. okay um so that's one piece of it some of them also um can mutate or there's something called anti uh, antigenic variations so they can actually mutate um to get around our like um, our defenses, but also things like antibiotics uh, or even some some antimicrobial or yeah antimicrobial plants. Um, there's a lot less uh, antigenic mutation against like garlic and olive leaf extract and like natural antibiotics than there are like penicillin, amoxicillin, um, cephalexin, things like that. But so they've studied this. What some of these, um, especially like strep and staph, are notorious for this, where they can mutate and they create a pump within their cell, within their that organism, to actually pump out the antibiotic so it doesn't attack them. Okay. Like a filter, like it just like has it like a filter, it just filters it on through instead of letting it stay around and destroy it. Um uh like a filter, but in a, like a pump, an active filter. So filter in my mind kind of sounds like a passive thing, right? Like that it's just filtering it through. But no, this is actually an active pump that it creates and it mutates so that um, it pumps it around or through that organism and not let it um, attach to begin destruction. Gotcha, roger that. Yeah, so um, these microbes are smart, right? They're trying to stay alive. <laughs> So they create these um, adaptogenic changes um, or mutations to sidestep, you know, like, yeah, our antibiotics. People say, well, I took an antibiotic. I took an antiviral um, that was prescribed to me and I'm still sick. You know, why is that? Oh, because those bugs can change. That's why we're seeing a lot of like um, antibiotic resistant bacteria um, is because they've created these um, mutations and these adaptations around those antibiotics. Yeah. Okay. And then they can also um, hide within cells. Okay. Um, so not just camouflage uh, themselves, but actually like enter in cells and become a little bit dormant or latent because if they're inside the cell, um, our immune system can't always see them right? Like our immune system travels through our lymph system, through our blood uh, vessels. And so if you have to think it's inside and hiding within or um, a cell, uh, when our immune system is looking for it, it looks like our cell. So it's not going to look foreign and not going to attack that cell. That's what HSV one and two do, right? Yep. A um, the the family of um, herpes human viruses, HSV-1, 2, chicken pox, shingles is why people can get shingles over and over again. Um, it's because those actually hide within our neurons or within um, the nervous system, the neurological pathways, and we don't have a lot of immune cells in there. Um, so yes, they're very good at hiding inside the cells. This is the thing, same thing with like um, malaria does this and sometimes Lyme um, does this. They will actually hide and parasites will hide within the cell so that um, they, lay, they lay dormant. And then when, a, um, when the environment uh, changes within our body that is um, better for them to grow, then they will, yeah, um, go from latent to a chronic infection again, um, create symptoms in our body. So then like with shingles, with HSV, we have breakouts. With Lyme, we have like Herx reactions or like, um, 
even, or flare ups. Sometimes these chronic infections that have been latent and come back as chronic can trigger autoimmune conditions. So sometimes people have flares for autoimmune, um, lupus, MS, um, even things like IBD or Crohn's, um, that root cause could be a chronic, yeah, um, slash latent infection of sorts. Does it make sense? Okay, um, let's see. Also, um, another piece is sometimes, so sometimes those organisms can hide in the cells, um, but another way that they can um, kind of elude our defenses is sometimes the size of what we're using to, to target them. So sometimes the size of the antibiotics, sometimes the size of like, if you're using a garlic tincture or um, olive leaf extract or like astragalus or um, lomatium, like all these awesome anti-microbial um, herbs, echinacea, um, sometimes it can be the size of them. So like a difference between taking something in a capsule, taking something in a tincture, sometimes the size of those molecules can be a little bit too large. Um, and so then the um, microbe can kind of um, dodge that, um, uh, that attack, if you will. Yeah, so that it doesn't kill them directly. Sometimes, so sometimes the size of the particles that we're trying to um, administer to help target these bacteria, also or viruses, um, or yeah, other infections, parasites, is important to take note as well. So um, I want to bring that up because sometimes people will come to me and they'll be like, "Gosh, I've been taking like oil of oregano, which is a very potent, broad spectrum." um antimicrobial and they'll be like i've been taking it for months and i still feel sick right it's like okay well we need to re we need to change things up right either that bug is becoming a little bit adaptive to that and mutating against that um or it could be the size or we have to wait sort of for that life cycle of that bug to come back around to where you can target it right to where it's um out in the open and not hiding if you will so then we can target it with our antimicrobials or other therapies um, to support the immune system. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I hope that makes sense. That's what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. <laughs> Give you a little bit of a rundown about, um, we talked about different components of the immune system, but I hope that helps. Um, the reason why we wanted to talk about it and bring it up is because um, we always think about, oh, you know, like being acutely sick, like having all those symptoms at the very beginning of an infection. Um, but there are a lot of uh, a lot of people who have these underlying chronic and latent infections that um, they may not be able to find right away. Um, or if you don't do labs when somebody's in a flare, sometimes they won't come up. Right. Um, and so being able to understand how to kind of read the CBC, read these labs can give you more information and hopefully shed a little bit of light as to what might be going on in your particular situation. Yeah. It's Q&A time now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Have some questions. Yes. Um, okay. I think it's helpful to understand this under context, like, as we're discussing this, I think if I was a listener, I would think, well, I don't feel sick, right? Um, and the whole point of this is that, like, I think that sometimes we have these underlying latent <laughs> Um, infections that we're really not even aware of that are creating symptoms that we just can't figure out what they're linked to, right? Like fatigue or just not having like energy levels that you thought you should, or I don't know, you're the doctor, like kind of general symptoms that were like, I don't know, like, I feel like I should feel better, but I don't. And, but I'm not like outright, like I don't have shingles all over me, you know, like, yes. Like, so, yeah. okay. Yes. Real quick. Um, so the reason why I want to address this is because 
this can be a very common root cause for people, right? And I'm always trying to find the root cause. So if you have a diagnosis, things like, yeah, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, any autoimmune condition, I want to rule this out first. Yeah. Um, POTS, it's becoming a little bit more popular. Um, the POTS, uh, postural orthostatic um, tachycardia syndrome. Um, let's see. Fibro, yeah. Um, or if you feel like, okay, I had, I had somebody come to me last week. Um, she's in her forties and she's like, I guess I'm just getting old. Like, I just feel bad. She feels fatigue and like achiness and just doesn't feel, um, not even a hundred percent. I don't, I would say she doesn't even feel 60%, but like to get out and hang out with her friends or like to, you know, stay and watch her kid, watch the whole ball game with her kids, um, or with her kids playing. And, um, yeah, she said that to me. She's like, I guess this, maybe this is age. I just, maybe I'm just getting old. And I'm like, okay, at 40, we shouldn't be experiencing <laughs> symptoms that make you feel like you're 70, right? Like if you, uh, don't feel like your age. <laughs> and so you may not have a diagnosis of these things, but you may not feel like um, you have the energy or like the motivation to do the things you want to do. Um, those can be underlying infections because they are like kind of whittling away at your resources on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, and so, and since they don't, always get tested for, yeah, you don't always find these things. Um, so that's why we want to talk about it. That's why we want to bring it up. Yeah. Um, because this could be somebody's root cause. Yeah. And I think it a, can impact our mental health too, right? These can be root causes to mental health issues. Um, yes. and then B like from a, because I heard this on barbell shrugs, they were talking specifically for athletes. This guy addressed this for elite athletes. He tests these things because I like to quote, the body is going to adapt to the level of health of the body, mm -hmm. right? So like if we're training and we're not getting the results from training or we're not recovering, this could also be part of the root cause because the body can only adapt it from my world, become fitter, stronger, faster, to the level of health that ha it has. And if it has chronic infections, it's not super healthy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a manage, it's a matter of managing resources. Yeah. You know, you have to think your body wants to be very as efficient as it can. Yeah. Um, but if it's managing those resources and trying to address some underlying infections, it's not going to be available to do the everyday stuff, to do the challenging stuff. Yeah. Um, to, yeah, uh, create a fitter, healthier um, picture for folks. And I think the reason he came on to this whole, like, because he now he just specializes in the immune system. Um, is he was a weight loss. Like, I guess he helped people with weight loss. Oh, he figured yeah. out healthy bodies drop weight. Mm -hmm. Like when you just focus on creating a healthy body, it automatically loses the weight, yeah. but a body that isn't healthy, like it doesn't have the resources or it doesn't have the, the, the bandwidth <laughs> yeah. lose the weight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very true. Yeah. Um, and then kind of, and he talked about, and maybe this is what you can um, expand on, like T, Th1 and Th2, those are just the two branches of the immune system, like I guess in a simplistic way of talking about it. Um, yes, yeah. So it's the Th is the T cell helper cells, the okay. one and two, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a matter of how our body, the ratio in which those cells should be produced. Yeah. Um, the TH1 and TH2, that could probably be a whole nother episode, to be honest. There's a lot in TH1 and TH2. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, allergies, how well your immune system works, but even cancers, 
um, can be a huge component of where if your ratio of TH1 to TH2, they're not, um, they can kind of get flipped over time and that can be in relation to inflammation, but yeah. Um, Maybe yes. this will just be the segue to the next episode then is we'll talk about TH1, TH2, because he also talked about like cortisol and how cortisol inhibits TH1 and yes. stimulates TH2. So then you can get a picture of low, like adrenal fatigue when it really could be chronic infections that are triggering cortisol to lower TH1. Um there's a fine line there, but yes, because this is where doing other labs can be helpful because um, that can also be a picture of inflammation. Yeah. Um, so you've got to kind of tease out uh, what are the biggest contributors to that, um, to those ratios of TH1 to TH2. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So then we'll talk about that next episode. We'll talk about that next time. Perfect. Okay. Do you have anything else? I don't think so. All right. Yeah. So just kind of a synopsis then for people, like if they haven't pursued this route, then they need to work with their practitioner to see about possible panels to maybe look in to see if this is a root cause to some of their unresolved symptoms. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Start with your CBC first. Docs yep. always run that, that complete blood count where it looks at your red blood cells and your white blood cells. Look at that first and then go to the very bottom of that page and look at your neutrophils, look at your, yeah, your monocytes, your basophils, your eosinophils, um, and your lymphocytes and just see where you are within that range. Yeah. I mean, they'll have sort of the normal reference range and see where you are. See if you're on the upper end um, or if you're on the lower end. Um, whether they've been flagged as high or low or not. And then at least kind of start giving you a little bit more information as to what could be contributing to your root cause. And then that gives you more evidence to bring that up with your practitioner um, to dive in a little bit deeper. Cool. All right. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. You're welcome.